Hello everyone and welcome to another live presentation here on my channel, Luis Borrero Visual Artist. Welcome uh, everybody that uh, is coming by today and for those of you that are joining week after week, thank you for your support. We're almost at 500 uh, viewers here on, on the channel, which I'm very excited about. I really, really appreciate your wonderful support and your comments, uh, sharing the content. And uh, today I have a really, really exciting uh, presentation. It's one of my favorite subjects. I'm going to be talking about stack process lead white, which is uh, the white, uh, lead white of the old masters. It's the paint that has been used since antiquity by painters. So I'm going to be talking about in depth about the manufacture and uh, the working methods of uh, the lead white in the context of painting, European painting in particular. So um, as usual, as before I begin, I like to talk about my references. This is so important to me because um, there's a lot of information out there and uh, it's important to, to decide where I'm getting this information from. Um, it, I, I just want everyone to know that I don't really uh, do uh, these presentations based on opinion. I like to uh, present my research and uh, uh, just to just detail how I go about doing my research, which is so important. I The first thing that I do is I look at the historical uh, sources. Uh, in this case, I'm using all manuscripts, um, followed by the scientific uh, research uh, that is published in mostly technical journals. And then uh, I take into account the uh, experience that I'm using these materials, the practical knowledge. So it's just not enough to just read something and you know regurgitate it. I like to, if I'm doing a live presentation, I'm actually uh, working with these materials and painting with these materials. That's so important to me, and that's really what the uh, channel's about. It's about uh, in-depth research, historical research, the scientific research, and then the practical application of that knowledge. So um, before I begin, uh, let's just go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the resources that I'm going to be using today. Um, the, in, week after week, I'm using pretty much the same old books, uh, but today I'm going to be introducing two new books. Uh, I'm using, I'm going to be uh, referring to Sanino de Andrea Sanini's The Craftsman Handbook, which uh, I've talked about uh, many times here on the, on the channel and a lot of the presentations. It's a wonderful book. You could get it at Amazon. It's a must-go-to uh, must book if you're into materials and um, Renaissance painting techniques. So I highly recommend it. Another uh, great book that I'm always mentioning, unfortunately, it's in, uh, it's in Spanish, um, is Francisco Pacheco, El Arte de la Pintura. And now, this is probably the most complete uh, treatise on the art of painting ever written. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's a very, very heavy book, and it's very complete. Uh, Francisco Pacheco was Velasco's teacher, so there's a lot of information here that it's, it needs to be explored. Um, another great book that I'm going to be sharing today um, it's The Artist Techniques in Golden Age Spain by Saira Beliz. Now this is a wonderful book. I got this, I, I believe this book is out of print now, um, but this book you could find uh, perhaps uh, in a library. Uh, I believe I got this book from the Met Library. I just f went in and photocopied the book uh, and it's wonderful, wonderful uh, investigative <laughs> A source uh, for, you know, um, all anything that has to do with uh, painting in Spain. It has, I believe, six treatises, uh, and it's translated into English, which is wonderful for those of you that do not speak Spanish. Um, another book that I'm introducing today, and it's just a wonderful book that uh, has been influential. It was influential to a lot of uh, 17th century artists, uh, and a go-to source for uh, northern painting, especially in England, is Miniatura or the Art of Liming by Edward Norgate from 1627. 
this book is just wonderful. It's so rich in its details, and uh, we're going to be using it as a reference. All right, so now that I've uh, detailed the sources, um, I want to begin by talking a little bit about the history of um, lead white, and specifically the stack process. Um, this, the stack process is a different method uh, from the early manufacture of lead white. Um, it involves in, uh, well, before I start detailing the process, uh, let's just talk about very, very quickly about uh, the history of lead white. Lead white was uh, documented by uh, Roman uh, writers and it has been used since antiquity. Um, now, you could research the history of lead white, just wonderful. There's just so many resources on the internet that you could do the, you know, the in-depth research of the history. Um, and uh, up to uh, past medieval times, all the way up to the Renaissance, uh, the early Renaissance, um, artists started using uh, lead white, uh, using the very traditional methods, the traditional manufacture of uh, using uh, lead, the lead metal, and exposing that lead metal to the vapor, the acetic vapors of vinegar and uh, tan bark or horse manure. Now, in the 17th century, that method sort of evolves, and uh, manufacturers began using uh, clay pots uh, filled with vinegar and uh, stacking this uh, just trays of um, uh, pots of uh, uh, you know clay with the metal and vinegar inside, and this was a revolutionary method because the yield of the lead white was much greater than just sealing a pot with just vinegar and just burying it and just hoping that it would, you know, there, there would be a, a, a strong reaction. And what is exactly lead white? Well, you, if you take a lead metal and you expose that metal to an acetic vapor, the corrosion on that metal uh, will, will be white. And that is, there's two processes. It, first, it turns into uh, lead acetate, and then it will later transform into basic uh, lead carbonate. And I'm going to be detailing that process. So I've um, gathered some photos of the process uh, for you guys here, so uh, I could sort of detail the process. But before I do that, I want to just uh, read a little bit about the, the um you know, the, what is written about lead white by uh, uh, early authors like Sanino Sanini. So, um, let's see, Sanino Sanini details uh, here, uh, he has a, a, a paragraph. It says here, on the character of white lead, a color made alchemically from lead is white and it's called white lead. This, is, this white lead is very brilliant and it comes in little cakes like goblets or drinking glasses. Now, he goes on to say, the more you grind this color, the more perfect it will be. Now, here, um, you see that uh, Sanini is describing the color, but he's not describing the manufacture of the lead white, meaning that perhaps he was getting, um, as, as it says here, and it comes in little cakes, like goblets or drinking glasses. So that means that he was most likely getting the material from a, from a manufacturer, in, uh, in the form of a cake, and essentially is the manufacturer would prepare this material, and uh, once it was uh, ground, or perhaps not, um, they would pour this material into a cup and put it in the sun to dry, and it would form a solid cake. And the artist would buy this material, uh, very finely ground, or perhaps not. Um, but it, I don't believe that it was finely ground because here he goes on to say the more you grind this color, the more perfect it will be. So this is important to my presentation today because today there's manufacturers of stack process lead white that sell the ready-made uh, pigment uh, perfectly ground to uh, a standardized uh, commercial 
uh, you know, standard, and uh, they sell it to artists, and uh, it's wonderful, and you know, it's, it's a wonderful material. But I found that by preparing the material from scratch and going through the whole process, you get an amazing range of effects in your final product. Meaning that it, uh, you, as I'm going to share with you, artists uh, would grind this uh, lead white very finely. By the time that uh, artists started working in the Venetian method, artists didn't grind their paints so fine, so their pigments so fine. So um, what, that results in a very different type of paint. And that's so important to, uh, to the technique that, I, you know, that I'm sharing here. Um, now, that's one of the, the arguments for making your pigments. Uh, why manufacture this pigment at all when, when you could essentially buy this pigment from uh, already a, a, a reputable uh, manufacturer? Well. The reason is to have that control uh, and that creative control to give you that range of effects. Um, and um, it's, it's apparent that the old masters were getting it, the material in a very raw state, meaning that perhaps a manufacturer lightly ground or washed or perhaps not uh, the pigment and then they would uh, send it out to uh, a retailer and artists would get it from this retailer. Now there's another uh, account here on Francisco Pacheco's El Arte de la Pintura that, I, that I'd like to share with you. Um, in page 483 of this wonderful book, um, Pacheco goes on to say, uh, let's begin with the white used in oil painting and mix with all the other colors. It should be the very best quality and that is the white that comes from Venice. Now, Venetian ceruse or Venetian lead white was considered the best lead white uh, used uh, throughout the uh, Renaissance. And so there was already a, a, an industry established in Venice um, that catered to artists and perhaps to other industries as well. Um, he goes on to say, it this this pigment resembles little stones uh, and little hard stones that, that uh, resemble uh, sharp, uh, sharp cuts or it, that stones that have been cut with a knife, excuse me. Uh, and then he goes on to say, the most ordinary method is to, uh, to prepare it is to grind it with water very finely and to let it dry in the sun in little cakes. So there you see the same method described by Sanin. Uh, he's getting the uh, lead white already uh, in a raw state and he's further refining this uh, pigment. So the idea that paint painters were preparing their lead white from scratch is uh, already debunked. I mean uh, artists here in two very reputable uh, treatises. Uh, two sources are describing that they're getting the, the perhaps the rough pigment and washing it and refine it. He does go on to describe how to wash it. So, uh, in meaning that Pacheco is getting a very rough uh, mass of pigment, and then he would have had to wash the pigment and grind it down so it would be serviceable. This, uh, excuse me, serviceable to painting. So um, this is so important to uh, study this pigment because uh, uh, artists were, uh, uh, there was already an industry of pigments, but they weren't really manufacturing a lot of their pigments. They were getting them ready made, right? So let's just go ahead and uh, look at what Norgate has to say. Now this is a this is in English, Old English, okay, and let's see here. To prepare Cerus, he has instructions here, uh, and it says Mr. Hilliard's Way, which was a, a, a famous uh, watercolor uh, artist from England, it says here, having ground your Cerus in water without gum, put it into a vial of, with a good quantity of fair water distilled or filtered, 
and being well shaken together, let it stand a while, and before it's settled, powder off the third part of the water. So right there you see another process, but again, going back to the grinding and refining this pigment, meaning that it has to be very, very finely ground. And that is uh, what I did. I did a recreation for, uh, for the live presentation, um, meaning that I took, uh, now I've been manufacturing lead white for about uh, close to 20 years. Um, and I've been using it in all my paintings. It's only lead white that I use. I don't really use uh, commercial lead whites. Um, but, and the reason is because of all the effects that I get. Um, now, I go through the whole process. I, uh, many years ago, I made a big stash of lead white, which I have the documentation here. I have the photos. Um, and I, what I did is I just uh, made a bunch of pigment. And this pigment, I, I prepare it in little batches uh, to service different paintings and for different effects. So I didn't just prepare all these tubes of paint from the get-go, I just, uh, I have the raw pigment and then I refine it, grind it finer if I'm looking for a very fine effect, very uh, refined painting, or I, uh, you know, leave it rough, uh, rough, I, I will, will not grind it for uh, perhaps as long. So this has been uh, very important to my development in my painting and I'm gonna be sharing the whole process. All right, so I have some photos. Um, let's just go ahead and begin with um, the first photo. Here I have, um, where am I getting the lead metal? Um, I, I usually use scrap lead, um, and I usually get this at any scrap yard. Uh, this is, uh, uh, these are all uh, telephone tubes uh, that I just found in a, in a scrap yard, and I uh, clean, uh, flatten these tubes with a, with a hammer. And then I clean this, uh, this, uh, this metal with acetone, just to make sure that it's perfectly clean and there's no oxidation on there. So, um, and once I've done this, I will roll these, um, these pipes and I will put them in, this is the, first, the, the actual stack. Um, this is an actual pot uh, little pots filled with vinegar. Now, these are not clay pots. They're just regular plastic uh, garden uh, pots. And I'll use double pot, a pot that is sealed on the bottom with vinegar, and then a second pot inside of that pot with the actual coil. And what results after three months, um, 90 days to be exact, is in, uh, you see here the actual ox the, the pots, uh, excuse me, the coils, the lead coils have oxidize and you get there the basic uh, lead carbonate. And let's just look at a, another detailed shot of um, that reaction. There you see the actual uh, coils uh, with the oxidation or the corrosion, excuse me, uh, of the lead white. Um, now once I have this process all completed, now I will scrape this off and I begin the washing process. Um, this is it's so important to wash the pigment. And here in Norgate's um, treatise, he describes to, uh, it's very important, this is actually funny. Um, he recommends to taste the water in the lead white uh, as you're washing it. I don't recommend anybody doing this. This is <laughs> very dangerous, you should be having safety equipment, uh, and that's a disclaimer here on the channel. Uh, I'm doing this with safety goggles, a respirator, and I use gloves, and I would never taste the water to make sure that the water, the, excuse me, the lead, uh, uh, by the, excuse me, the lead, basic lead carbon has been fully washed. Uh, what I do is I use a pH meter, um, and I just test the pH of the water. And if it, if it has a neutral testing, well, uh, it's essentially clean. But Norgate does gives a, gives a clue to uh, wash the, uh, to change the water at least 12 to 13 times. And that's essentially about, I found that that's about the right, um, the, 
right amount of times to change the water until it, the pigment is fully clean. Um, there in this picture you see the lead acetate uh, floating uh, on top of the, the water and the, the uh, uh, non-soluble water, uh, basic lead carbonate, uh, sinks to the bottom. And that's how you separate both. And now what happens if you don't wash the pigment? Well, you get some severe yellowing in your uh, final paint, which is not, not good. So uh, you have to wash this pigment. Uh, very thoroughly and uh, you know manufacturers as a matter of principle would do this um, but in the old days it doesn't seem that that was the case as is described by Pacheco and Sanini. All right so let's just move on once I I, in, I will um, there's another photo where uh, okay there's the new there's the other photo okay so there I, I'm using a glove and to sort of work the pigment into the water and wash the pigment thoroughly okay and um, just I'm working that pigment and just making sure that it I'm getting you know uh, all the lead acetate out so okay once I have this um, I will decant all the lead acetate water in a uh, obviously environmentally safe way um, and let's just move on to the next photo and there you see exactly what Pacheco described. Le, it, now the lead particles or the lead uh, uh, oxidation uh, or corrosion resembles little stones or beach, almost like beach sand. And it's very hard, they, these are uh, very hard sort of uh, 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 corrosions, you know, that you will have to grind down. You can't just take this and just mix it with oil. You really have to grind this down. So once I have this fully washed, then I will begin the process of grinding um, the pigment down. Now, today manufacturers use a ball mill, and I have tried the ball mill, and it works really well, but I don't find that I get the control. So that's why I prefer to grind each batch individually. And let's just go ahead and move on to the grinding process. Let's see. Um, of the safety concerns so um, now this is important uh, you will see that the oil and the pigment will start uh, joining together and the water will actually get expelled from the mixture and this is exactly how it's described by um, uh, 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 Felipe Ninos in, uh, in his treatise 
there's a detailed shot of uh, there you see the lead white being separated from the water it gets separated and the reason is because you get a lead soap um, and the water doesn't want to be there uh, so you, you get a combination of the linseed oil with the lead white and it's a very safe way to prepare the lead white without having to actually handle it in powder form and uh, there's a lot of speculation how the old masters handle this toxic pigment well the reason is because they were handling it wet um, and it makes sense you, ha you wouldn't have to let it dry now there is descriptions on, uh, to make little cakes but there, I, there you see that I'm grinding it um, very robustly with the stone. And what results is a wonderful paint that I'm going to be showing you in a little bit. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful paint quality. And Felipe Nunez describes this process. I'm going to read you, um, uh, let's see, our, in our, I have a, the passage here. So it says here, when you want to make white lead as though it were ground with walnut oil, grind the white lead on the stone very well with water, then add linseed oil, and you will see that as you continue grinding, the water comes out and the white lead remains with the oil and appears purified. Now there you saw the, the, the process described, and indeed uh, a lot of artists today will handle the, this material in powder form. I don't recommend, uh, I, don't, I never handle it in powder form. Uh, I have uh, made uh, a cake and what happens is it solidifies. You know, I, put, I will put this cake in the sun and it will solidify into a very hard cake and then I just, I will add oil right there and then and it becomes, uh, you know, uh, oil paint essentially. So there's no powder in the studio. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's very unsafe. All right, I have some questions here. Um, Ron, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, this is the line. Okay, um, so th this is, I'm not sure, Ron, your question is this line, but this is lead white. Um, but uh, perhaps there's a, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, the right translation. Um, let's see. It, so I have a, uh, a comment from Alex, or a question from Alexander. Uh, in the Renaissance, only lead white was used? Well, it was not the only lead white, only, it was, in oil painting was essentially the only white used. Um, but in fresco, they used uh, lime white, and uh, in you know you could use lime white with uh, water media, and lead white you could also use with uh, water media as well. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, I see. Okay, Ron. Um, so this is not lime. This is lead white, but lime was used as the other white. So in, in this recipe, uh, with the lead white, you can combine uh, the calcium carbonate with the lead white, and it's, uh, it's uh, the Dutch called it Ludwit. And it's essentially a cheaper type of lead white that is more inexpensive. So by combining the two available whites, you get a superior white essentially because the, the, uh, the lime or the calcium carbonate will make it slightly transparent and uh, I guess uh, it will create a neutral environment in the acidic oil. So yeah, it's, uh, it's it, I guess uh, there's confusion. Uh, so in oil paint, there's, you could use lime uh, white with oil, but it becomes sort of transparent. Uh, so by putting a little bit of lead white, you make it a little bit more opaque. But for, mo for the most part, I mean, Caravaggio, Velasquez, Rubens, all the, they, you know, all the way up to, uh, I guess since the beginning of oil painting, lead white really was the, the uh, go-to white of the old masters. Um, 
in the 19th century, they created a new method of manufacture, which is uh, uh, called Kremnitz white. Uh, and that's essentially what we know today as flake white. Um, but today, uh, a lot of manufacturers are returning to uh, the stack process lead white because a lot of artists really enjoy the, uh, the impasto effects that you could uh, you know, get from this wonderful material. All right, well, so there I've provided some um, sources and some instructions. Uh, you've seen uh, the full grinding of the paint, of the, of the pigment. So now I've, I have, let's just go ahead and move on to, I prepared, I have a little surprise here. And I've prepared some samples for you guys of the lead white. So you can see how this material behaves. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Um, artists using this material, uh, and this is something, a disclaimer that I like to make here in the channel. I will present a lot of techniques here in the channel. Um, I, I will do my best to uh, do the full research before presenting any material or any opinion. Um, but these are not, you know, uh, uh, rules or um, uh, techniques that, you know, were set in stone by the old masters. Th this is just a range of techniques used by the old masters. Um, and it's important to take that into account. When I say stack process lead white, uh, what type of stack process lead white with which oil? Uh, now, you saw that I ground the pigment for half an hour and then I ground the pigment for a full hour. Imagine the range. Uh, there's instructions in the manuscript that I have to grind black for eight hours on the stone. So, and Senino says to grind, if you grind this uh, color for 20 years, it would be so much the better. So imagine the range of uh, materials that the old masters were getting by just having a stone and getting having the material, the raw material, and starting from scratch. Meaning you could grind essentially the paint for half an hour, an hour, two hours, three hours, or even four hours. So there's a great range um, of, of, of uh, uh, of working processes that the old masters used. And I make no claims that any one process is, is the one uh, process that any old master used. That's so important because there's different schools, there's different periods. Um, even last week during uh, my presentation on Grisai, um, you know, which artists uh, during what period of their life? So it, there, it's important, what I like to do is just to present different options and of course, uh, the artists using their creativity and uh, their intellect will make their own decisions and arrive at their own creative solutions, right? So that's so important. So, all right, well, so let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about the effect of the linseed oil and the walnut oil on this material. So now we have the stock process lead white, wonderful. We have the, the, the lead white of the old masters but now we have to mix it with a, either a linseed oil or a walnut oil, as is recommended by the old masters and the, and the treatises. Well, this is where it gets tricky. The pigment will behave differently, which each individual oil is very sensitive to, uh, to, the, to the oil that has been used. And when you uh, go to the museum and you see a painting by Rembrandt, or by uh, Da Vinci, you see such a great range of techniques. You see a very fine technique, a very, very uh, uh, you know, smooth surface, and then you'll get a textural surface. And that has to do with how the material was prepared and what oil the master was using. So I like to use here, um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm using a sable brush, and I want to show you. So let's begin with, I, I uh, uh, made four samples here. Uh, three of them have been ground for an hour, and one of them has been ground for half an hour, okay? 
I have wash linseed oil as described by the old masters. You take the linseed oil and you wash it with water and it cleans all the impurities of the oil. So that's what I did here in the first sample. In the second sample, I have uh, linseed oil that has been cooked with litharge, okay? Uh, the Italians call this type of oil olio cotto, okay, or boiled oil. Then I have a third sample, which is uh, stack process, let white ground for an hour with uh, sun thickened oil, okay, that has been purified as well. And then I have a final sample, which is walnut oil, purified walnut oil cold-pressed walnut oil that has been boiled with litharge, red lead, and white lead, just as described by Palomino in one of his recipes. So let's just go ahead and begin uh, with, uh, let's see how this will behave. All right, so this, the first sample feels very much like a commercial paint that you would buy. It's a very beautiful white, and uh, it doesn't have any, I don't really see any special characteristics. I mean, you could do some very fine detail. This is a perfect modeling white, if you're looking for a very sort of standardized, smooth surface. And it's very, very much what you would see with a commercial paint. You know, pretty standard. The second sample, clean my brush here. The second sample is heat bodied oil. And now within the heat body oil range, there's also a lot of variation because how long was the uh, oil heat body? Well, there you begin to see some different effects. And the paint is long, meaning that it has sort of this stringy quality, but it's still very dry and it resembles somewhat, I mean, you see this effect in a lot of oil, uh, oil paintings from the past, um, this sort of string quality, okay. And uh, now there is a defect with the heat bodied oil. It, you notice here how uh, perhaps the camera cannot pick it up uh, but this white is, this is linseed oil that has been purified, and this is oil that has been boiled. Um, and you see that it's slightly more yellow. And Rubens is uh, documented as using the heat bodied oil, and um, I guess he uh, describes the yellowing of the oil in some of his uh, comments, and he describes it as a disease of the heart. And this oil will yellow more than the uh, washed oil. So uh, it seems to have been used for highlights. Now, this oil is very special. Uh, this is the sun thickened oil, okay? And let's just take a look at the. Now immediately, just look at the difference. I mean, I could just essentially set the paint down. I'm not even touching the surface with the brush. It just falls right off. I could do this amazing. It's very stringy, very long. And you could do very, very fine dots with it. And even this, this reminds me a lot of Vermeer paintings and some of his highlights. Okay. And look at the difference, the three different oils behaving in three different ways. Just right there you see the amazing range this material exhibits and uh, to just have lead white is just not enough. It's important to analyze the oils as well and see um, you know, how they behave. And now look how long, I mean I could take this white and just really brush it out and because it's finely ground I could do velatura. And this is Velatura. It's just a very, very thin, very thin veil of white. Okay. 
and you could see right through that paint. So um, this is what I was describing last week, that the velatura involves, you know, uh, putting color over a, uh, a gray underpainting, and then you get, you know, um, an effect, a collective effect of color. All right, so we have so far linseed oil, okay, wash linseed oil, heat bodied linseed oil, and sun thickened linseed oil. Let's just go ahead and, and take a look at uh, heat bodied walnut oil. Now, this oil is found in Caravaggio and Vermeer and Van Dyke. I use this. And where am I getting this information? Well, you could go to the National Gallery Technical Bulletin and they have charts printed on the, it's called Paint Media Analysis and they, uh, they could detect whether the oil has been heated or not. Uh, in the case of uh, sun thickened oil, they really can't detect that type of oil, but they can detect the heat bodied oil, linseed or walnut. And look at what a beautiful oil, I mean, it's, this is just very white, very, very, this will dry a lot more flexible than regular walnut oil. Now, why were they using heat bodied walnut oil? Well, perhaps because walnut oil will not be as flexible. So, yes, that very, very interesting. Let's, let's try to move on the camera. Ron, let's, let's see. I'm going to try to adjust here the exposure a little bit. So now that's a very, very interesting comment. And the reason is because lead, stack process lead white tends to be on the grayer side and it's not usually as white as Kremnitz white. Very great observation. Uh, it's well documented by Laurie. Um, Laurie was uh, a, a wonderful author. He wrote a book, The Methods and Materials of Artists, I believe. And he documents this phenomenon. The lead white indeed is not as uh, white as the Kremnitz white. That's why this method of manufacture sort of um, gave way to the new uh, method of, man of lead white manufacture. Um, so, uh, in you see that, I mean, as you're painting, uh, you, the old masters tended to paint you know, on sort of on the, the dark side. Um, a lot of contrast, and it, the reason is because their white um, wasn't perhaps as light, and they wanted to, uh, you know, uh, get that really high contrast. Now, this is very interesting, Ron, because um, they have found tempera repaintings in Caravaggio's uh, most of his works, and why would Caravaggio be uh, retouching his oil paintings with tempera, meaning? that stack process lead white mixed with a tempera medium retouching his oil paintings. Well, the reason is because if this lead white is mixed with tempera, it will be so much whiter. The linseed oil is actually degrading the color. Now, by grinding the color even more, you get you could improve that quality. That's the reason that, I mean, uh, this is a half an hour grind versus a uh, you know, an, an hour grind. So you get a full range. Uh, but by grinding the pigment a lot more, a lot finer, you get, you know, a wider uh, white. So very interesting observation. Uh, so thank you for commenting and thank you for, for uh, coming by. Um, so, all right, I just want to show you now. Um, okay, so we have lead white. Now what? How do we, are we making paintings with this uh, this material? Well, I want to show you some paintings that I've made with the light white, uh, and these are some of my own works, latest works. And I just want to show you. This is a painting that I that I made, uh, and here I've used velatura, you know, an under uh, under layer uh, in you know a grisaille under layer, and then I've put velatura using a very finely ground, a two-hour grind, uh, lead white, uh, stack process lead white, and uh, the painting's varnish. So you see that, the, you know, you get a, a sort of a, um, 
enamel-like quality uh, to the light white, which I really, I really enjoy that that quality. Um, and of course, this painting is very dark, and it's you know it's meant to be very you know uh, high contrast. Uh, but I want to show you another painting where I work the light white with a lot more texture. This is a painting in progress right now, and there I, I've. Uh, I've worked these areas with a lot of texture and by just dragging the paint, I'm not using any medium and uh, just dragging the light white, letting it do, uh, you know, uh, it's natural, taking its natural course and you get this sort of range of textures that are really beautiful um, and, you know, it's, it's a really gorgeous effect. So there I have presented the uh, mystical light white and I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, videos uh, that document the, the manufacture of light white. Many years ago, I, I, I posted my um, formula of making my light white on uh, Painting Perceptions, paintingperceptions.com, wonderful website. And uh, he uh, posted an article called The Great White Lead Shortage because a lot of European manufacturers stopped making, so artists had to start it. A lot of artists wanted to, to get their hands on light white, so um, this is essentially uh, a, a way about going, you know, where you could manufacture your own pigment. Please be careful, take your, uh, your precautions uh, if you're gonna manufacture this uh, material. It's a wonderful material, and with just 50 pounds of light white, you know, scrap metal you could make, uh, a lifetime supply of lead white uh, in a very inexpensive way. All right, so before I go, I'd like to tell you, uh, in for a lot of you uh, that are coming by the channel, uh, that are uh, you know interested in painting, perhaps are uh, studying uh, to be artists or already are artists and are looking to improve, I want to tell you about my uh, three courses that I have published on Udemy. Uh, these are uh, brand new courses. I have two brand new courses. I also have a classical drawing uh, course that has already been on there for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, it, check them out. If they're, I'm going to be posting the description, uh, you know, the, in the description below, there will be links to these, uh, to these courses. Uh, there, there's a full curriculum there that I really, uh, I'm very proud of. Um, and, that is really the base, the base to begin painting. Uh, I talk about, um, you know, light and shade, uh, proportion, all the wonderful things that, uh, and knowledge that you will need to undertake uh, the art of painting. So uh, check it out. Uh, I believe Udemy is uh, having a sale this week. Uh, so uh, it'd be wonderful. Also for those of you that are, uh, you know, new, uh, please subscribe to the channel um, and share the content with your friends. I have one last question from Ron before I leave. Uh, Ron, is, uh, Ron is asking, what about poppy seed oil? Poppy seed oil was used by a lot of uh, Dutch painters from the 17th century and Belgian painters. Um, now, the consensus of poppy seed oil by the National Gallery Technical Bulletin is that it does not uh, yield to a, uh, a film that is very flexible, like linseed oil. Linseed oil really has superior qualities, and second to that is uh, walnut oil, uh, and if you heat body the walnut oil, it's further improved. So I, ha I don't really use poppy seed oil. It was not very popular. There is some still life painters that used it with a lot of uh, success uh, to get a very, very beautiful, very smooth type of paint. Um, uh, let's see. I have another um, another question from Enso. Um, did you have any negative interaction problems with other colors? I have not. I have been making this paint, this pigment for 20 years, and I have never had any problems with, um, with the light white interacting or turning black. There's some documentation uh, some documents uh, that says that it turns black. Um, now, if it's not properly washed, you will have problems. The pigment will be uh, 
not serviceable. I mean, you you know, you, you're gonna get yeah, it's gonna be a very yellow paint. So it's important to wash it thoroughly. Um, now, I in terms of pigments that I just do not use and that are, that are mentioned by the old masters, Calcell Earth is the one that I do not recommend. I have had some disastrous results uh, with Calcell Earth, and I don't use it anymore. Uh, and uh, some authors from the past uh, actually mentioned that using Cassell Earths, I think I believe it's Palomino, uh, to use Cassell Earth is to tempt fate. So I don't I don't use Cassell Earth, but the lead white has behaved wonderfully. Uh, I have uh, I have one last um, one very last uh, image that I want to share, and it's an analysis. Uh, that was done of my lead white uh, from Cornell University. Uh, it's a, an old student of mine, Luisa uh, Sminska. Uh, she was uh, studying at Cornell University and she uh, was uh, noble enough to uh, do some tests and um, I gave her uh, a manufactured lead white, uh, modern manufactured lead white from a prominent uh, house. I will not mention uh, uh, who that uh, lead white belongs to. Uh, but I could tell you that the top photo is my lead white, the middle photo is the Kremnitz white, and the bottom photo is Rembrandt. And uh, the reason that I did this test or this analysis is to show you the crystalline structure. Um, and it, when you use stack process lead white, there's a, a diverse range of um, crystalline structures and look at the difference between the top sample and the bottom sample. In the in the um, in the middle sample you have a modern manufacturer light white and it has a uh, homogeneous uh, uh, you know texture uh, and that really results in a very different material. So um, just one last bit of information. Uh, I'm very much uh, involved in scientific study and I want to share that with you guys uh, you know just to be as uh, transparent as possible in the, the information that I'm sharing here so again I'd like to thank everyone for coming by I really really appreciate the support we're almost at 500 uh, visitors and I really you know um, I'm very appreciative of the support and the questions and uh, the loyal viewers. So uh, I will continue to share the information. I hope this is helpful for a lot of you. And uh, I will be posting, uh, we're doing the lives every two weeks. So I'll be back in two weeks time with another live presentation. Uh, thanks again for your comments uh, and, you know, your wonderful uh, feedback. Uh, I wish everyone a great weekend and uh, take care, be safe. We'll see you next time.